Amen. Good to see everybody. Good morning and welcome home. Welcome those of you who are here pit nows. Welcome those of you watching online. Uh, welcome those of you who are in Columbus. It is good to see everybody today. And uh, just a reminder, Kyle mentioned this at the beginning of the service. Uh, if you're watching us online, uh, don't go anywhere after the message. You in here don't go anywhere after the message either. Are you in Columbus? All right. Sean was going to share an exciting announcement with you in Columbus. Kyle will come back up and share an exciting announcement for us. So uh, don't go anywhere if you're watching online after the message or after the, our uh, closing songs. So uh, we're finishing up today this series called Cut and Dry. And we, all, we know by now, cut and dry means it's settled, there's no argument, it's a done deal. And so an example of something that's cut and dry is you don't buy your wife exercise videos for her birthday. <laughs> you don't do that, okay? You might as well just tell her she's fat and get it over with. That's cut and dry, you don't do that. But what if your wife tells you one year, you know what? The only thing I want for my birthday is these exercise videos, DVDs. Will you order those for me for my birthday? <laughs> this may or may not have happened in my house a few years ago, and I may or may not have looked at my wife with the biggest deer in the headlights look that I've ever had on my face ever in my life. After first service, for those of you Star Wars fans, uh, after first service, uh, somebody came up to me and said, that story reminded me of the line in Star Wars. It's a trap. So, so you know, that was, that's, wasn't so cut and dry, right? That she said, that's the only thing I want for my birthday. Will you please do that? And so she finally convinced me, it's okay. That's what I want. And with a little bit of trembling and trepidation, I went online and I ordered the DVDs for her. But you see, not everything in life is cut and dry. Okay? If you're a black and white thinker who sees everything as this or that, right or wrong, not, you don't like hearing this, but not everything in life is cut and dry. However, that doesn't mean that nothing is cut and dry. Because the fact is, the Bible is full of places where it tells us things that are cut and dry to God. And this proverb that we've been looking at for the last several weeks is one of those. It's, in, it's Proverbs 6. And it says, there are six things the Lord hates, no, seven things that he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who sows discord in a family. Seven things that God, what? Hates. I'd say that's pretty cut and dry. Seven things that God hates. And so today we come to part six, sowing discord. If, this, if you're just joining us in this series for the first time, uh, the reason it's six and not seven is we combine the two that are about lying. So right now we're on part six, sowing discord. So let's talk about that phrase a little bit for a minute. I think we know what discord means. It means disharmony, fighting, arguing, not getting along, drama, all of that is, is discord. Now, what a, what a, as Kyle said, what a timely Sunday for this message. We had the race thing that blew up again this week. We still have not gotten that right. We have the virus going on. And you got people on both sides of the spectrum on the virus. You got those on this side who think it's silly and dumb and nonsense, and you have people on the other side who are taking it very seriously and maybe even think it's the end of the world, and both sides are pointing at the other side. And then politics. Let's not even get started on politics, right? And we have this climate in our, in our culture right now where you can't even, you can't even disagree with anybody. And there's all this discord in our culture right now. And so this message, what we're going to talk about today, yeah, discord in a family, but what we're going to talk about can apply to, to any relationships that we have. And it's something we've got to, to, to take into account, not just in our family, but in our culture as a whole. Now, some level of discord is going gonna, is gonna to happen, right? Right? Because none of us are perfect, and we're all different, and so those two things alone mean that anytime you have any kind of relationship with anybody, there are going to be times where there's some discord, where you don't see eye to eye, maybe you annoy each other. That's not what we're talking about. 
This proverb says, who sows discord in a family? Who sows discord? In other words, you know, when a farmer sows seed, a farmer doesn't do that just haphazardly or by accident. There's intention involved in that. There's purpose involved in that. And so what we're talking about, just so we have a, um, a working definition, it's harboring or cultivating actions, words, or attitudes that cause discord in a family. That's what we're talking about today. God hates that. He hates it when we hold on to attitudes or or perspectives or thoughts or words or actions that, that continue to cause discord in our relationships. God hates that. But you know what God loves? He loves it when we get along. He loves it when we get along. I, uh... <laughs> Every now and then, I will walk past a room in my house, and two of my boys, or maybe all three of my boys, will be sitting there somewhere on a bed or something, and they'll be maybe, maybe they'll be watching some YouTube videos together and laughing, or maybe they'll be having a conversation together that Sarah and I didn't start and had nothing to do with. They just started all on their own, and they're sitting there peacefully getting along. Isn't that such a joyous moment, right? It's such a joyous moment because they're actually getting along. And sometimes I just sit there and I'll just, I'll just kind of take in the moment. And, and occasionally, if they're not watching, I'll, I'll even snap a picture to capture this rare moment when my kids are getting along. Well, if I, as an imperfect father, get that much joy out of seeing my kids get along, how much more joy should our perfect, holy, heavenly father get when he sees us getting along? He loves it. This is very important to him. In fact, Psalm 133 says this, how good and pleasant, say that with me, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Connecting point, how good it is when God's people live together in unity. God loves that. And so our principle today is simply God hates discord in a family, but he loves it when we get along. God hates discord. He hates it. I believe all the stuff happening in our culture right now over all these issues, the politics, the race, all this, all this stuff, I believe God's heart is breaking over all of that. It's breaking. And ours should be breaking too. Because if God hates discord, we should hate it also And we should be doing everything that we can do in our families and in our culture to strive for the harmony that the Bible says God loves. He loves it. He hates discord, but he loves it when we get along. And so um, before we go any farther, just to, again, just to talk about the word family, I've already touched on this a little bit. Keep in mind, yes, we're talking about our family family, you know, your parents, your kids, your spouse, your siblings. Yes, we're talking about that kind of family. We're also talking about church family. We're talking about people you work with. We're talking about any any group of relationships, any group of people that you have a relationship with, what we're talking about today applies to that. So keep that in mind as we go through and we talk about this. But as I was thinking about this proverb and I was thinking about this last thing that it says God hates, discord in a family. And I was just kind of, I was reading through it and something really cool occurred to me, all right? I'm a nerd, so maybe this won't be as cool to you as it is to me. But I thought this was so cool. I realized that the first six things in our proverb lead to the seventh thing. The first six things cause discord in a family. Think about it. Pride, that leads to family discord. Lying or or, uh, giving false witness, those lead to family discord. Devaluing life. I want to stop on that one for a second because I think most of us, when we think of devaluing life, we think of like the big hot button issues like abortion and assisted suicide and things like that. But we need to understand today, there are a lot more subtle ways that we devalue life, right? When I treat, if I treat my family like dirt, I am devaluing who they are. If I look down, if I judge somebody because of the color of their skin, or I lump a bunch of people together into a group, into a stereotype because of the color of their skin, I am devaluing who they are as people created and loved by God. 
If I treat my loved ones as if they're just here to cater to me and everything I want, I am devaluing who they are as people created and loved by God and made in his image. If I demonize somebody who has different political views than me, I am devaluing somebody who is created in the image of God. You can disagree with someone without devaluing who they are as someone God created and sent his son to die for. Those are all more subtle ways that we devalue life. And all of those things add up to family discord. Plotting evil, that's conniving, plotting, you know, manipulating to get your way. Guess where that leads? Family discord. Running toward wrong and away from what's right is going to lead to discord in the family. All of those things lead to the last thing. And so if that's true, then the opposite is also true. Avoiding all of those things, avoiding all of these is going to lead to harmony in our relationships. So the entire goal of this proverb is what we're talking about today. Harmony in our relationships, all of our relationships, because God loves that. Well, I thought that was pretty cool when I, when I realized that, but then I kept thinking about it and I realized something else that's pretty cool. I know this is all kind of academic, but I promise I'm getting ready to get to our one big point, okay? I realized something else really, really cool. And that's this, the first thing, pride, leads to all the other things. Just like, just like the first six things lead to the last thing, so does the first thing lead to the other six. Think about it, pride, that leads us to lie, to bear false witness. That leads us to devalue life, to look down our nose at other people. That leads us to plot evil, to run towards what is wrong, and ultimately leads to family discord. And so what happens then, there's, there's this pattern in this proverb, and this pattern is kind of like a pair of bookends. You have one bookend, which is pride, and pride leads to the five things in the middle, and all the five things in the middle lead to family discord. Or to go, to, if you want to move backwards, if you want harmony in your relationships, then you got to avoid the five things in the middle. And if you want to avoid the five things in the middle, guess what? you got to start by looking at and crucifying, nailing to the cross, your pride. Well, Pastor Pride, that's not really an issue for me. All right, if you're walking around saying that, then uh, I, th I think it probably is, right? I am the most humble person I know. It's my greatest quality. I destroy everybody at being humble. Right, okay, if you're walking around saying pride is an issue, then it's probably a bigger issue maybe than you realize. But the second thing is, pride is the subtlest of creatures. It is the subtlest of creatures. And so we have to be careful of that. We've got to address our pride. And so our one big point is this. If you want what's at the end of the proverb, which is harmony in your relationships, then you've got to go back to the beginning, which is letting go of your pride. If you want what's at the end, which is harmony in your relationships, you have to go back to the beginning, which is letting go of your pride. If you want what's at the end, you have to go back to the beginning. Say that with me. If you want what's at the end, you have to go back to the beginning. In Columbus, make sure you're joining us. Say it with me. If you want what's at the end, you have to go back to the beginning. If you want harmony in your relationships... Start with your own pride. Start with your own pride. Because even if you think that it's not an issue for you, like I said, pride can be the subtlest of creatures. In our house, um, we just moved into our house, I don't know, eight or nine months ago. And um, I would never, in the middle of winter, I would never ever leave our doors standing wide open. That would be dumb, right? That would destroy our utility bill, letting all of that cold air into our house in the middle of winter. I would never do that. But you know, not long after we moved in, it started getting cold, and I realized that in three of our, of our exterior doors, 
the weather stripping was starting to wear a little bit and was even gone in some places. And I figured this out because I could feel the cold air just, just a little bit, just kind of seeping through between the door and the door jam. Now, the truth is, if I left my windows op- or my doors o- wide open in the middle of winter, that would absolutely destroy my utility bill. But the fact is, those little places where the weather stripping is wearing or missing or cracked, that's costing me in my utility bill too. It's just more subtle. It's a few cents here, a couple bucks there, but guess what? Over time, that adds up. And so even though I would never, ever, ever leave my door standing wide open, that's obvious. Apparently, I'm willing to live with the little subtle uh, eating away at my utility bill because I still haven't fixed it, I'm embarrassed to say. But you see, pride can be like that. When most of us think of pride, we think of the person who walks around with their chest puffed out and they're looking down their nose at everybody because they think they're better than everybody else. And we think, well, that's not me. I would never do that. I would never be that way. But you know what? Every person in this room, every person sitting in Columbus or watching online, I would dare to say every single person hearing my voice, including me, has little places where the weather stripping is starting to wear. The weather stripping around our hearts, and there's little, little manifestations of pride that seep in. And make no mistake, those are slowly and subtly eating away at our relationships because the weather stripping is worn. And so I want to ask you a few questions today. To just, these are just sort of some, some self-reflection questions. Now, we could, we, could, I could, we could do these all morning long. The list I'm going to give you is about half as long as it was Thursday, all right? And I'll tell you straight up, I didn't like coming up with these because uh, more of them apply to me than what, than what I want to admit. But I want to just ask you a few questions. I'm asking you, how's your weather stripping today, okay? How's your weather stripping I know you would never leave your door wide open, but how's your weather stripping? Do you have a hard time taking ideas from people? In other words, when somebody offers you an idea or offers you a thought, is, your, is your, the first thing that goes through your mind, why are you telling me what to do? I can do this myself. Or is your first thought, ah, oh, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Or maybe similar to that, related to that, do you have a hard time seeing that somebody else's perspective, which is different than yours, may have some merit? Oh my goodness, do we need to hear that today in our culture? Because nobody wants to listen to anybody else, right? Nobody wants to admit, you know what? The other side may have a point. That doesn't mean that I agree with everything they say, but you know what? They may have a point here. None of, nobody wants to say that today. And that's pride. It's pride. When someone tells you a story, do you have to tell one that equals or surpasses theirs? That's pride. When someone else gets credit for something you did, do you have a hard time letting go of that? I had to deal, man, God had to seriously deal with this one in my heart several years ago. There was was another guy and I that both kind of, in my mind, kind of had an equal investment in this project, and when it was done... Um, people were just oohing and on over the job that he had done, and I, over he had done. And I was sitting there thinking, well, I had just as much invested in this as he did, and I'm not getting any credit. And I'm telling you, I had to take that to God. I had to take that to the cross several times and say, God, would you crucify this in me? Because I know this is just pride. That doesn't come from a good place. That doesn't come from humility. Do you have a hard time apologizing or admitting when you're wrong? Do not look at your spouse. Don't do it. Columbus, do not look at your spouse. Sitting online, don't look at your spouse sitting on the couch with you. Do you have a hard time apologizing or admitting when you're wrong? That's pride. Do you have a habit of embellishing just a little bit to make yourself look just a little bit better? That's pride. That's subtle pride. Last one, do you struggle to be transparent with people and instead work to hide your weaknesses and shortcomings? That's pride. These are all subtle manifestations of pride, and they can slowly and subtly eat away at your relationships. And even if they never destroy a particular relationship, at the the very least, they will prevent that relationship from being everything that it could be and everything that God wants it to be. 
So if you want to avoid the things that God hates and you want to embrace what he loves, start with your pride. So I want to give you this morning, I want to give you three humble habits for harmony. And I'm proud of that because usually Kyle's the one that's good at coming up with stuff like that, but I came up with it all on my own. Three humble habits for harmony. The alliteration, you got, you got, you like that? Three humble habits for harmony, to cultivate humility, to avoid the bad habits in the middle of our proverb, to have greater harmony in your relationships. Practice these three habits. The first one is be willing to change. Be willing to change. Here's two things that often happen in our relationships. First of all, we often get more focused on what we want the other person to change than what on, on what we want to change, right? How many of you, when was the last time you prayed and told God what he needs to change in your spouse? Don't raise hands, don't raise hands. What would happen in our marriages? What would happen in our work relationships? What would happen in any of our relationships if we stopped focusing on what we want God to change in other people and started praying, God, what do you want to change in me? Husbands, wives, Start asking God what he wants to change in you and stop focusing on what you want him to change in your spouse. Be willing to change. So that's the first thing that we, that we often do is um, we focus on what, what we want the other person to change. Second thing is we get defensive, right? We get defensive. Defensive means you, somebody says something to you maybe that you don't want to hear and you immediately make excuses or you immediately just turn the tables and try to turn the conversation back on them. They tell you what you're doing that's annoying them and you immediately say, oh yeah, well here's what you're doing, right? That's getting defensive. It means not listening to what they're saying. It means not being willing to face your own weaknesses and shortcomings, and when we do that, when we get defensive all the time, we do two things. First of all, we make it difficult for other people to have difficult conversations with us. Because after a while, people just start saying, well, I really feel like we need to talk about this, but why bother? He's just going to get defensive. Why bother? She's not going to listen. And so that prevents people from having difficult conversations with you. But the second thing it does when you refuse to face your own weaknesses and shortcomings is you rob yourself. You rob yourself of opportunities to learn and grow and change and be a better person. Defensiveness robs you of opportunities to grow and change. So have the humility to just face your shortcomings and face your weaknesses and face your mistakes and be willing to let God change those in you. Pray that prayer constantly. God, what do you want to change in me? Have the humility to do that. Secondly, acknowledge that you don't know everything. Acknowledge that you don't know everything. When my... Um, Near the end of my first ministry assignment, I was a youth pastor, and uh, it was a crazy time. Sarah and I had got married kind of in the middle of that, and uh, near the end of my time there, I found myself in the emergency room having chest pains that were radiating into my shoulder, and, and we called the dial a nurse, you know, with our insurance, and she said, you need to go to the ER and get checked out. And so I found myself laying on a bed in an ER, and it ended up not being my heart but it was an ulcer in, in my esophagus. I, I literally gave myself an ulcer in my first ministry assignment. And there were a lot of contributing factors to that. But after we moved from there and I was able to look back and reflect and pray, God, God helped me realize one of the reasons I gave myself an ulcer is because I had this stupid idea in my head that if I was going to be a pastor, I had to have all the answers. And the truth is, none of us have all the answers, pastor or not. You know what my job is? Not as a pastor, but as a Christian, which means it's your job also, if you are a believer. Our job is not to have all the answers. Our job is to point people to the one who does. That's our job. None of us have all this figured out. None of us have all the answers. In fact, so one of the best ways that you can cultivate in yourself, 
the humility to realize you don't have it all figured out. Occasionally put yourself in a situation where you know you're not going to be the smartest person in the room. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, man, I don't know that I'm ever the smartest person in a room. Well, first of all, maybe you're not giving yourself enough credit. But, but secondly, okay, man, I don't know, maybe this part of the sermon isn't for you. But occasionally put yourself in a situation where you're not the smartest person in the room. About a year and a half ago, I went, to, went up to our Nazarene headquarters outside of Kansas City, and I had a meeting with three other guys. And one of those guys was the, at the time, new global Um, discipleship guy over the entire denomination. The second guy was the professor of education and discipleship at the seminary. I had a couple classes with him. Dude's brilliant. And the third guy, I don't remember what his title was, but he was another kind of big shot in the area of discipleship in our denomination. And so in this room was the global discipleship guy for our denomination, this other guy whose title I can't remember, and the, the professor of education and discipleship at the seminary, and me. Did I feel outclassed and over my head? Yes. But I'm glad I went because one, I learned a few things and two, it was a reminder to me, I don't have it all figured out. I don't have all the answers. Sometimes the three most humble, liberating, faith-filled words we can say are, I don't know. In fact, say that with me, Columbus 2, watching online, say those three words with me. I don't know. Some of you are going, oh, that hurt. Sometimes finding the best solution to an issue starts by saying, I don't know. Sometimes when you're not getting along with your spouse, the best solution, the best way to move forward is to start with, I don't know. Because what happens a lot, especially in marriage, is we, we think that we get it in our heads, I know, I know the answer to this. I know what we need to do right now. I know how we need to handle this. I know, I got it figured out, right? And then you dig in your heels And then the problem is your spouse also has the idea, I know, I know what the answer to this is. I know how we need to address this. And so both of you are digging in your heels because both of you think you have it all figured out. And maybe the best thing is for both of you to step back, take a breath and say, I don't know. I don't know the answer here. I know that I love you. And I know that I'm committed to you, and we will figure it out. But that has to start by admitting that you don't know, you don't have it all figured out. So whatever arena of life you're talking about, have the humility to acknowledge that you don't know everything, and you don't have it all figured out. Our third habit, prioritize others' needs and wants over your own. Prioritize others' needs and wants over your own. If you want harmony in your relationships, it can't be your way all the time. Can't. Say that word with me. Can't. It can't be your way all the time. If you want harmony in your relationship, that's pride. Pride causes us to think like that and act like that. We have in my house, I've shared this with you before. Um, I, at first service, I almost said we have this finger gesture. That's not, not what, it's not that. Um, But we do kind of have this finger gesture in our house, and it's this. The world does not revolve around you. That's what this means in our house. The world does not revolve around you. It doesn't. It doesn't revolve around me. There are times when I know that Sarah has a different idea or a different plan or a different want than I have, and there are times when I'll speak up and I'll share my opinion, and then we'll have to try to figure it out. There are times when I do that, but there are also times when I know she has different thoughts than me, and I just don't say a word, not because I don't want to stir up trouble, because I need to remind myself it's not always about me and what I think. And sometimes the most humble thing that we can do in our relationships, honestly, is to just shut our mouth. I'm not saying don't ever share your opinion on something or your thoughts. But sometimes, you know, you don't have to fight every battle. It doesn't have to always be your way. And there's a time where, you know what, I know she wants something different. I'm just, I'm not even going to tell her that I don't want that. Because it can't always be about me. Sometimes it's got to be about her as well. So 
practice harmony in your relationships by having the humility to say, you know what, sometime I'm going to set my own needs and wants aside, and I'm going to focus on this other person's needs and wants. Have the humility to do that, because if you're always digging in your heels and you're always insisting on your way, and it always has to be what you think and what you want and what you need, you know what? There is never going to be harmony in your relationships. The other people in your life are going to be miserable, and in the end, you're going to be miserable, and they're going to resent you. And there's a good chance they're going to start manipulating and conniving. That's one of our proverbs in order to go around you to occasionally get what they want. The world does not revolve around you, and it doesn't revolve around me. Have the humility to say that. So our three humble habits, be willing to change, acknowledge that you don't know everything, and prioritize other needs and wants above your own. That's easy, right? That's all easy. Okay, it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. But you know what? You know what we have living inside of us? If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you know what you have? You know who you have? You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And in our own power, in our own strength, this is not possible. I'll tell you that right now. It is not possible. We are geared towards being selfish and prideful and thinking the world revolves around us. But as we yield and surrender to the Holy Spirit and say, God, change whatever you want to change in me. Do whatever you want to do in me. He gives us the power to live this way and treat our loved ones this way. But we have to be surrendered to him in order for that to happen. So last week, I think it was, uh, Kyle gave us a, a, a verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That's a great verse to memorize. I want to give you one today that's a great verse to memorize. It's a great relationship verse. Paul says in Colossians 3, he says, make allowance for each other's faults. That means be patient with each other. That means give the people in your life room to be as imperfect as you are. And if you don't think you're imperfect, then we got to go back to the pride thing, all right? Give the people in your life Room to be as imperfect as you are. Be patient. Make allowance for each other's faults. And then forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. You don't you want me to tell you how many times that, that thought is in the Bible? We have to forgive because God has forgiven us. You know how many times that's in the Bible? I don't know, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. If you've been forgiven, if you've asked God to forgive your sins, then you've got to forgive other people. And he says, above all, clothe yourselves with what? Which binds them all together in perfect harmony. You know, when you think about it, you could make a case that the opposite of of love is pride, what we've been talking about today. Because love, love always focuses outward on other people. Love always focuses on other people. Pride focuses on yourself. Love focuses outward, pride focuses inward. You want to deal with the pride in your life? Start practicing biblical, genuine love towards other people. Well, at the end of all of these messages... We've been ending with this verse, this prayer of David from Psalm 139. Search me, O God, know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Early on in this series, as Kyle and I talked about this, we realized what a great prayer for everybody to pray, for us to pray at the end of each of these. Now, God, is there, any, is there any piece of what we've been talking about today? Is there any of that in me? These five things in the middle of this proverb, is there any of that in me? And I do wanna ask all of us to pray this prayer again today as we close out this service, but I wanna put a little bit different twist on it. Because here's the deal. Do you realize that we have a responsibility to each other? We live in a very individualistic culture And we focus a lot on our own personal rights. 
And sometimes we need to be reminded, especially in the church, that we do have a responsibility to each other. There's a, there's a passage, there's a story in Genesis where it's the first murder in human history. A guy named Cain kills his brother Abel. They were both sons of Adam and Eve. And so Cain, he kills his brother Abel. God goes to Cain afterwards. God knows what happened, but he says, Cain, where's your brother? And if you're familiar with the story, what does Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know. It was a rhetorical question, but the proper answer to the question is yes. You are your brother's keeper. We do have a responsibility to each other. And so I want to ask you this morning, as you pray this prayer of David, search me, O God, test my heart, as you pray that prayer, Ask God to show you, am I living my life in a way that makes it easier for my loved ones to choose what you hate? In other words, God, do I treat my loved ones in a way that tempts them to pursue what you hate? Or do I treat them in a way that inspires them to embrace what you love? Yes, we need to examine our hearts for evidence of these things in our lives. But we also need to ask, am I, am I making it easier for my loved ones to choose these things? In other words, let me give you some examples. Are your expectations so high that when your loved ones mess up, they feel like they have to lie to cover it up? Ooh. Do you, do you, are, is your demand for perfection so high that when your loved ones mess up, they feel like they have to lie to cover it up? just so they don't have to mess with your stuff? Are you so demanding of getting your own way that your loved ones feel like they have to plot and connive and manipulate to get around you just to occasionally get their way? Are you so rigid and harsh with your kids that they want to run towards evil to rebel against you or the opposite end of the spectrum, this is the most difficult balance to find in parenting, I think. Are you at the opposite end of the spectrum where you're, you're providing so few boundaries and consequences for your kids that it makes them prone to want to run towards evil? See, the Apostle Paul calls that being a stumbling block. Now, make no mistake, other people are still responsible, right? If I lie to my wife because I feel like she just demands perfection and, and I don't want her to know that I messed up and I lie to her, that's, that's on me. That was my choice. But if you treat people in such a way that it just seems easier to them to choose the thing that God hates, that's on you. Paul calls that a stumbling block. Doesn't let them off the hook but it does put you on the hook for the way that you're treating your loved ones. So would you pray this prayer this morning? As you pray, search me, O God, would you pray, do I, in fact, say this with me, Columbus Online, say this with me. Do I treat my loved ones in a way that tempts them to pursue what you hate, or do I treat them in a way that inspires them to embrace what you love? Would you stand with us today?